John Esselmont. John Ebenezer Esselmont, of a distinguished Scottish family, was the youngest child of his father, who had the same name. He was born on May 19, 1874, at Fairfoot Cults, Aberdeenshire, Scotland. After Ferry Hill Private School and Robert Gordon College, he went to Aberdeen University. On his graduation with honors in April 1898, he received not only the degree of Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery, but he also won the first Phillips Research Scholarship. During part of 1899, he did valuable research work at Bern and Strasbourg. In December 1899, he became assistant to Professor Cash at Aberdeen University. A little more than a year later, he moved to Australia. While living there on December 19, 1902, he married a brilliant pianist to whom he had become engaged before leaving Scotland. Not well suited to each other, they soon separated. John Essenmont was never physically strong, and at the end of two years he returned to Aberdeenshire because of ill health. On finding that the climate there did not improve his health, he went to South Africa and stayed for five years. In 1908, he again returned home and accepted the position of resident medical officer at the Home Sanatorium, Southbourne, Bournemouth. In 1912, he, along with some other doctors, became interested in a state medical service. Two years later, he wrote a paper on this subject and read it before the British Medical Association. The Advisory Committee on Public Health gave his paper careful attention and found it very useful. A seeker after truth from his earliest years, Dr. Esselmar had not yet found a belief that he could accept. One Sunday in December 1914, he had dinner in London with Dr. Parker, who was also interested in a state medical service, and his wife, Catherine. On this occasion, he heard for the first time in his life from Mrs. Parker the word Baha'i. Because of his eager response, she gave him the Baha'i message, and she spoke to of her meeting with Abdul Baha during his historic trip to London in 1911. In answer to his request for literature, she lent him some pamphlets. This conversation and his reading of the pamphlets led him to make a thorough investigation of the faith. Without delay, he wrote to the Baha'i Assembly of London for further information and bought all the Baha'i books in English that he could find. He studied these books so intensely that soon, in a series of letters to Mrs. Parker, he was making suggestions of books that he thought might interest her. In February 1916, about four months after he had first heard of the cause, he wrote a long letter to a believer in Manchester. A touching portion of this letter concludes, Oh, may people all over the world soon turn to God, as revealed in Baha'u'llah, with humble and contrite hearts, begging for his forgiveness and blessing, and imploring his mercy and bounty. Then shall his kingdom come in men's hearts, and the whole world become one home, and all mankind one family. Dr. Esselmont became the first Baha'i in Bournemouth, and his teaching there was largely responsible for the establishment of his first spiritual assembly. When in May 1922, the first spiritual assembly for England was established, Dr. Esselmont was one of its members and he continued to serve nationally until he left England for the last time in 1924. Deeply convinced of the need for an international language, that it must play an important part in the achievement of the unity of mankind, he learned to read, speak, and write in Esperanto. He was anxious to study carefully all the Baha'i books that he could find. He was not just content to read those available in English, 
He also took the pains to learn Persian and Arabic. Because of his own difficulty in finding the knowledge that he wanted, he soon became keenly aware of the scarcity of literature in English, and he decided to try and write a book that might help others in their spiritual journey. At the end of 1918, Dr. Eselmont received this tablet from the Master, translated by Shoghi Effendi. To his honor, Dr. Eselmont, upon him be greeting and praise. O thou lover of all mankind, Verily have I chanted thy verses of praise to God, inasmuch as he hath illumined thine eyes with the light of guidance, the light of the oneness of the world of humanity, so much so that thy heart overflowed with the love of God, and thy spirit was attracted by the fragrance of God. And I supplicate divine providence that thou mayest become a torch to that gathering, so that the light of knowledge might shine out from thee, that thou mayest be confirmed to act in accordance with the significances of the hidden words and strengthened by God under all circumstances. Concerning the book you are editing, send me a copy thereof. I pray the Lord to support thee in the service of all mankind, irrespective of race or religion. Nay, rather, Thou shalt deal with all according to the teachings of Baha'u'llah, which are like unto life to this glorious age. Upon thee be greeting and praise. Signed, Abdul Baha Abbas. On the 9th of January, 1919, Dr. Eselmark sent a copy of this precious tablet to the editor of Star of the West. In a letter to the editor, he wrote, We are delighted to welcome your president, Woodrow Wilson, to Europe, and hope that great goodwill result from his visit. There will be much unrest and fermentation in Europe for years yet, I expect. But unrest is better than the placid acquiescence with vile conditions, with slums, drunkenness, prostitution, sweated labor, and profligate extravagance. And it seems to me that on the whole, things are moving towards a better state of affairs, towards the most great peace. Following the Master's request in his tablet, Dr. Esselmont sent him a huge draft of the first nine chapters of his book. After the Master had read them, he invited Dr. Esselmont to visit him in Haifa and bring the entire manuscript. So during the winter of 1919-1920, Dr. Esselmont spent two months and a half there as the master's guest. Falling ill soon after his arrival, he was unable to meet with Abdul Baha as much as he had hoped. The master, of course, showed him every consideration. Dr. Esselmont has written, Abdul Baha discussed the book with me on various occasions. He gave me several valuable suggestions for its improvement and proposed that, when I had revised the manuscript, he would have the whole of it translated into Persian so that he could read it through and amend or correct it when necessary. In an appealing description of the master's daily life at that time, when he was nearly 76, Dr. Esselmont has stated, his unfailing patience, gentleness, kindliness, and tact made his presence like a benediction. Rahia Kanun has informed us that during this visit, Dr. Esselmont not only got to know Shoghi Effendi personally, but also collaborated with him and some other believers in the translation of an important tablet by the Master. On his return home, Dr. Esselmont completed the revision of his book and sent it to Abdul Baha. After its translation into Persian, the Master was able to correct three and a half chapters 
one, two, five, and part of three before his passing. In the first of 1920, Shoghi Effendi came from Haifa to England and entered Oxford University. The friends knew well that his reason for doing this was to gain more knowledge of English so that he would be able to translate with even more facility than before the tablets of the Master and all the holy writings into this language. Dr. Esselmark was one of the dear friends who welcomed Shoghi Effendi to England with genuine warmth and affection, and Shoghi Effendi visited him more than once at his private sanatorium in Bournemouth. A charming photograph shows them seated together, relaxed and happy, on the front piazza. Some years later, after the passing of Dr. Esselmont, Shoghi Effendi wrote to a friend, I shall ever recall the happy and restful days I spent at Bournemouth in the company of our departed friend John Esselmont, and I will not forget the pleasant hours we spent together while taking our meals in the sanatorium. On November 29th, 1921, at 9.30 in the morning, the following cable reached Major Tudor Pole in London at his office in St. James's Street. His Holiness Abdul Baha ascended Abha Kingdom, inform friends, greatest holy leaf. Urgently asked by Major Tudor Pole, to come to his office, Shoghi Effendi arrived there at midday. After he had read the heartbreaking news, he collapsed. Without delay, Dr. Esma wrote him the following warm and understanding letter. The Home Sanatorium, Bournemouth. Dearest Shoghi, it was indeed a bolt from the blue when I got to the poles wire this morning. Master passed on peacefully Haifa yesterday morning. It must be very hard for you, away from your family and even away from all Baha'i friends. What will you do now? I suppose you will go back to Haifa as soon as possible. Meantime, you are most welcome to come here for a few days. Just send me a wire, and I shall have a room ready for you. If I can be of any help to you in any way, I shall be so glad. I can well imagine how heartbroken you must feel, and how you must long to be at home, and what a terrible blank you must feel in your life. Christ was closer to his loved ones after his ascension than before. And so I pray it may be with the beloved and ourselves. We must do our part to shoulder the responsibility of the cause, and his spirit and power will be with us and in us. Several days later, in a letter to a Baha'i student, Shoghi Effendi wrote, The friends have insisted on my spending a day or two of rest in this place with Dr. Esselmont after the shock I have sustained, and tomorrow I shall start back to London and thence to the Holy Land. Despite his constant struggle with ill health, Dr. Esselman not only continued to teach both in prison and through letters, and to fulfill his Baha'i administrative duties, but also to help the newly established National Spiritual Assembly prepare his book which he now called Baha'u'llah and the New Era for publication. There was a brief delay while Shoghi Effendi himself reviewed the book. It is certainly no exaggeration to state that this now rightly famous book, written at a time when there was still a dearth of authentic literature in English or in any Western language, and published 21 years before Shoghi Effendi's own immortal history of the first century of the Baha'i era, God Passes By, has already served thousands of grateful believers in many countries as a much-needed introduction to the history and teachings 
of the cause. The Guardian has referred to Baha'u'llah and the New Era as a textbook of the faith and said that it would inspire generations yet unborn. Mary, Queen of Romania, the first member of royalty to recognize the station of Baha'u'llah, read the book first and felt that others should do the same. She called it a glorious book of love and goodness. This absorbing and comprehensive book contain such a large number of inspiring passages that it is hard to choose only a few from which to quote. In chapter one entitled The Glad Tidings, Dr. Esselmont clearly explained, Baha'u'llah asked no one to accept his statements and his tokens blindly. On the contrary, he put in the very forefront of his teachings emphatic warnings against blind acceptance of authority and urged all to open their eyes and ears and use their own judgment independently and fearlessly in order to ascertain the truth. In chapter 3, Baha'u'llah, the glory of God, first published as a separate pamphlet, he has movingly written, From his place of confinement in distant Akka, Baha'u'llah stirred his native land in Persia to its depths. Not only Persia, he stirred and is stirring the world. The spirit that animated him and his followers was unfailingly gentle, courteous and patient, yet it was a force of astonishing vitality and transcendent power. It achieved the seemingly impossible. It changed human nature. Men who yielded to its influence became new creatures. They were filled with a love and faith and enthusiasm, compared with which earthly joys and sorrows were but as dust in the balance. They were ready to face lifelong suffering or violent death with perfect equanimity, nay, with radiant joy and the strength of fearless dependence on God. At the conclusion of chapter five, what is a Baha'i? He wrote in the same vein, The life to which Baha'u'llah calls his followers is surely one of such nobility that in all the vast range of human possibility there is nothing more lofty or beautiful to which man could aspire. Realization of the spiritual self in ourselves means realization of the sublime truth that we are all from God and to Him we shall return. This return to God is the glorious goal of the Baha'i. But to attain this goal, the only path is that of obedience to his chosen messengers, and especially to his messenger for the time in which we live, Baha'u'llah, the prophet of the new era. During the autumn of 1924, a conference on living religions was held in London. Dr. Esamont wrote both a general pamphlet, Baha'u'llah and his message, and a small leaflet, What is the Baha'i Movement, for this occasion. In a section of the former entitled, The Baffling Modern Problems, he has made clear the need for the coming of a new prophet to heal the countless social illnesses of this day that the Christian Church has failed even to mitigate. By the end of 1922, the Guardian's already heavy burden of work had so greatly increased that what he urgently needed was more helpers. In January 1923, he wrote to the London Baha'is, the presence of a competent assistant in my translation work at present in Haifa would be most welcome and highly desirable, and I submit this matter to the members of the council that they may consider the matter as sending for a time one of the English friends who could attend with me to this all-important work. During that year, the sanitarium in Bournemouth closed owing to the death of the proprietor, and Dr. Elstenmark lost his position. In 1924, Shogi Effendi sent him a warm invitation to spend the winter in Haifa, and early in November he left London. On November 15th from Malta, he wrote to the friends in England 
that he was greatly enjoying his trip and that his health had much improved. While he was spending a day or two at Port Said, he had some happy meetings with the friends. On November 21st, he arrived in Haifa. Without delay, he began to work for Shoghi Effendi. The immortal Martha Root has written a touching tribute to Dr. Esselmont. She met him for the first time during April 1925 in Haifa, and she went to see him as did many others in the hospital where he lay ill. Soon after her visit, he became well enough to return to his own room. He lived in a house with some other Baha'is near the guardian's apartment in Abdul Baha's house. The guardian made sure that Dr. Esselmont received the best possible care. Every evening, his Persian teacher used to talk Persian with him for about an hour. In the morning, when Martha came to work with him, he would tell her in Esperanto the thrilling stories about the Baha'i cause that his teacher had told him the evening before. Martha has written, Our Baha'i brother was a great scholar. Everything he did bore the mark of extreme efficiency. In our Esperanto work, he was not satisfied just with any word, but sometimes we would discuss a dozen words and search their exact meanings in several dictionaries to find the word that would most brilliantly express the spirit of each thought. One day, when his illness prevented him from working, she said to him, If you do not do anything, you are still doing much work every day, for your book is spreading the Baha'i message in every land. During the last few months of his life, among other tasks, he was helping to translate his book into German. He spent the summer of 1925 in Germany, both to assist in this work and to try and regain his health. In September, he returned to Haifa. On November 22nd, 1925, he died of a stroke. Martha, with her usual professing simplicity, has written, Dr. Esselmont's sudden passing into the eternal realm brings home to us the importance of appreciating the value of the time. Are we working to the utmost and happily? Is our work efficient? If it is, whether in this world or in the next, we are a joy bringer to our friends and to all humanity. In the years after Dr. Esselmont's passing, the guardian showered honors upon him, naming him as one of the three luminaries of the cause in the British Isles and calling him the first of the 19 disciples of Abdul Baha. On the 30th of November, 1925, in a deeply moving letter to the believers of the East and West, Shoghi Effendi has described Dr. Esselmont. To me personally, he was the warmest of friends, a trusted counselor, an indefatigable collaborator, a lovable companion. With tearful eyes I supplicate at the threshold of Baha'u'llah and request you all to join in my ardent prayers for the fuller understanding in the realms beyond of a soul that has already achieved so high a spiritual standing in this world. For by the beauty of his character, by his knowledge of the cause, by the conspicuous achievements of his book, he has immortalized his name and by sheer merit deserved to rank as one of the hands of the cause of God.